Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Lakeview webinar series. My name is Gina Thorne, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing for Lakeview Health. It's my pleasure today to welcome you to our monthly webinar. Today's webinar is on dynamic family solutions, boundaries, and relationships. For those of you that are new to Lakeview, um, just a little background on our program. Um, our philosophy at Lakeview is that we believe that people who come to treatment at our program are um, open to health, wellness, and life balance. We believe that people can change to become life-saving and not life-draining. And our tagline, Find Your True North, really truly engages the individual to find that path that helps them with their long-term sobriety. Our focus is to really center around our belief of servant leadership. This is a culture shift for our organization in believing and trusting in our staff to act as the tool to help families and individuals struggling with chaos and pain. We offer an integrated health model that addresses the medical, psychological, spiritual, and physical needs of our patients. And our campus is warm and inviting, allowing individuals to feel safe and accepted when they come to treatment. We are an inpatient dual diagnosis residential treatment program located in Jacksonville, Florida. And if you're interested in learning more about Lakeview, we invite you to visit us at lakeviewhealth.com. For those of you that are looking for continuing education for today's webinar, we ask that you please complete the online evaluation form, online evaluation form immediately following this workshop. You should receive the evaluation within an hour after the workshop. If you don't get the evaluation form, please reach out to Jackie Cream at jcream at lakeviewhealth.com. All certificates will be emailed to you, so we ask that you please be sure to verify that your email is correct, so that way we can get that certificate over to you. I'd like to give a special thanks to Family Recovery Resource Experts, who is co-sponsoring this webinar with us today. And our guest speaker today is Jennifer Stow. Jennifer is a psychotherapist who brings a focus on therapeutic services to the Mark Hurst team. Jennifer developed a passion for family-focused recovery while working as a recovery coach at the Hazleton Betty Ford Foundation. She saw that addicts whose families were brought in as part of the therapy process did better in their recovery. She believes we all exist in relationships and that it's critical for all family members to face their own issues when one family member is struggling with alcoholism, drug addiction, gambling addiction, sex addiction, eating disorders, or mental health issues. Jennifer works with individuals and families to create and implement action plans to affect dynamic and effective functional change. Jennifer's most powerful moments as a psychotherapist come when families enter her office feeling like everything is chaotic and irrational, and they leave feeling like a rational human being. As a therapist focused on results, Jennifer feels like she's not doing her job if she doesn't see progress in her clients and their families. We're very excited to have Jennifer speaking on behalf of the Lacey webinar series today. And just as a side note, this particular workshop is um, being very, very well received. Um, we have close to 200 people on this webinar today. Um, so we ask that you be mindful of time. If you have questions, she's going to be opening herself up um, and answering questions throughout. Um, we, I will be fielding questions throughout um, through the pod, through the webinar series. Um, and then at the end, um, those that are interested in a copy of the slide deck, um, Jennifer will provide direction on how you might be able to access that. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and transition the presentation over to Jennifer so that she can begin her presentation. Hi, everybody. Let me get this up and going. So thank you, Gina, um, for that lovely introduction. Um, and including a little bit of my background, um, I just wanted to say a couple more things about how we really began to develop our philosophy um, at Family Recovery Resource Ex Experts, um, or otherwise known as FREE. Um, Mark Hertz and I met uh, about a year and a half ago and, and had a very passionate discussion about the numerous pitfalls that we see families seemingly stuck in over and over again. Um, and I myself often see individuals within the family getting quite a bit of help and assistance, but I consistently see families struggling to make comfortable, effective, and lasting change. So at FREE, we are broadening the continuum of care for families as a whole and providing continuity through their healing process with ongoing support, guidance, and resource coordination. 
Um, I think the easiest way to have you guys get a quick and easy feel for what we're doing at free is to have you watch um, a quick whiteboard video. When someone you love is facing addiction or mental health issues, it doesn't just affect them. It affects the whole family system. While that person's struggle may be the first to be identified, others in the family system often develop unhealthy methods of coping with the situation. That's why addiction and mental illness are known as family diseases. Most treatment systems focus primarily on treating the person with the issue, leaving family members short of resources for their own healing. So the person with the addiction or mental health issue can fall back into the family's old habits. As family recovery resource experts, we take a different approach called dynamic family services. As behavioral health professionals, we meet you where you are to provide the tools you and your family need to recover. The first step is to stabilize the situation, which can mean getting the person with the addiction or mental health issue the help they need. Then, we provide tools and resources to the family members to educate them about what's happening and how they may be unintentionally enabling their loved one's behavior. We help the family members gain insight into how focusing on their recovery is a foundation for systemic growth and change. Our experienced team promotes functional, lasting change in the whole family through coaching and counseling in real time as needed. Using dynamic family services to help the whole family heal makes it far more likely the person struggling with addiction or mental health issues will maintain ongoing and effective recovery. As results-driven behavioral health professionals, the free team wants to make your family system as self-sufficient as possible. And we're always here if you need us. Is a loved one struggling with addiction or mental health issues? Call us for a confidential consultation today. We answer our phones daytime, evenings, and weekends. So I just quickly want to go over um, these four stages of dynamic family services at FREE. Um, and this really came out of the work that we were doing with families um, and really the different levels that we were seeing families come into our office at. Um, most families come to us and they are, they're stuck. They're absolutely feeling stuck. Um, and at that stage, what we focus on is reducing conflict and reactivity so that we can begin to get a clear picture of the actual problem. Um, most of the time people come in and they say, wow, you know, Johnny is really the problem and he is just creating so much havoc in this family. And if Johnny would just stop um, you know, smoking weed or drinking or you know, fill in the blank, then our family would be um, healthy and happy and we could move forward. But what we find is if we dig a little bit deeper, um, that some of Johnny's behaviors are actually just symptoms of what's happening in the family and that really we need to look at mom and dad's relationship or maybe we even need to look at the trauma mom brings into the marriage and brings into the family. Um, so we need to begin to calm the family down so we can begin to define the actual problem. Many families are just stuck in rigid behavior patterns and they don't serve them anymore um, and they certainly don't move them forward. But they're known and therefore they're less frightening, so they're comfortable. So families want to keep doing them. Once we can stabilize the family and reduce the reactivity, we can begin to facilitate a little bit more of controlled movement that works toward growth. Once we know what that actual behavioral issue or, or family issue truly is, we can do some education around it. So we want to highlight what that current issue is for the family, give them some knowledge about it, give them some research, give them a way forward, and then really highlight what their adaptations have been to that issue. How have they been coping with this issue? Um, what does that look like for them? Are, they, are, are we seeing you know, a lot of attempts to control? Are we seeing people isolate? Are we seeing um, people have huge emotional responses because that's how they're receiving um, attention and love in their family. We also work to provide resources for individual and families. Um, we want to define differing perceptions of the problem. We don't want to assume that every member of the family relates to that problem in the same way. So we really look at the individual's relationship with the family problem. And then we want to assist with values and boundary clarification. 
Um, so in order to move forward, I really need to know what my values are. I need to know what's meaningful to me to keep me safe and sane. And then, of course, every family needs assistance in navigating the behavioral health care system. Um, I think many of us would agree that even as professionals, it's very, very easy to get lost in this system. We have a lot of families who have, who have been with and seen a lot of providers. And as they move from provider to provider, they receive different philosophies. Um, they are given different treatment plans. Um, you know, different things are covered by insurance, depending on where they're at. It's a very, very confusing system to navigate. The next stage we really look at is um, insight. So how do we create healing? Um, and what we try to do is help each member of the family own what is theirs to own. They are in charge of that which they can control. And we do work on individual insight and growth so that we can influence um, a larger change in the family system. When we look at functional change, um, what we really want to look at is how do we continue to provide support and coaching and counsel in real life and real time, not just inside our office for an hour, but as family members are going out into their real lives and they're faced with these issues, and we're asking them not to return back to that known behavior pattern that hasn't served them, how do we support them in that? And we found that using technology, um, inviting clients within reason to reach out when they need to, um, has created huge amounts of change that we can't do if we wait until we just see them in our office. Um, so for example, I had a 17-year-old client who was um, in a very difficult situation with his father, who was entering treatment. Um, they were pretty estranged at that moment. And the young man was very, very angry at his father. And he passed him on the street one day and was um, extremely sad. And so I received a text from this young, young man who's 17, and all it said was, Jen, I'm having some feelings. Do you have a minute? And in about five minutes, we were able to normalize that situation for him. We were able to say, of course you're feeling this way. Of course you're angry at your dad, and of course you really miss him. You are feeling exactly how you should be feeling. And he was able to create resolution in that moment. He didn't go on to write a narrative, positive or negative, about anything he was experiencing. So we were able to resolve that very quickly in real life and, and in real time. We often offer ourselves up as a bit of a buffer as we're asking family members to learn new behavior patterns. So we say, if you feel stuck and you don't know what to do, that's a good time to reach out. Let us jump into the family with you and maybe be a buffer in between you and your husband, or you and your daughter, or you and your son, or you and your mother, so that we can actually live change comfortably and effectively. When we work with families, um, even when we're doing what, we, what would be considered an intervention, um, probably in the field at this time, um, we've really worked to redefine what that means because we found that we intervene in many, many different ways. So even when we go into a, a family meeting and our focus is on helping someone get into treatment, um, and even when we're trying to do that relatively quickly, uh, we focus on relationships. So at FREE, you know, we believe that um, if we want to heal, we have to focus on healing relationships. And that means our relationship with ourselves, our relationship with others, um, and maybe even our relationship with a higher power. We exist in relationship with others. We develop in relationship to others. And so we need to heal in relationship with others. We talk a lot about developmental or relational trauma. So looking at any less than nurturing event, um, conceptualizing trauma as loss. And when we do that, what we realize is we've all experienced this. We all have experience with trauma at some level. Some of us have, have trauma with a big T, and some of us have trauma with a little T. But regardless, it shapes our personality. And so we all have triggers. So in order to do the work necessary to heal from relational trauma, um, it's imperative that we all have a functional personal boundary system. And we'll get into that here in just a second. But I wanted to review with you some of the talking points we do with families when they, we bring them together 
um, to try to incite some change and create some resolution. So we'll ask them, you know, each family to create a statement and um, we'll look at, you know, why is, this, why is it important that you're involved? What, is, what skin do you have in the game? What's your stake in the game? We ask each family member to define the problem. So defining the issue as they see it gives us a lot of data. You know, what, what perception is everyone bringing to the situation? And we ask them to state how they see it impacting their family, themselves, how it manifests in themselves and others. So if we take the issue of addiction, um, we're not asking the family to write about Johnny. We're asking the family to write about addiction and how they see how that impacts their family. Because I guarantee you, Johnny's not the only one it manifests in, and it's not the only one it's impacting. Um, then we look at encouragement. So what are you willing to do to reduce the behaviors and the symptoms that you've listed? What are you in control of? When we talk about personal boundaries, we're not talking about, you know, I'm going to cut you off, I'm going to throw you out, I'm not going to give you money. For me, personal boundaries is really about that values clarification. So what do I need to have in my life to keep me safe and sane? What do I need to not have in my life to keep me safe and sane? And then being able to utilize the strengths that are in the family. So drawing the family's attention back to that what, which is working for them. You know, what are the resources we can draw on? And then having the courage to ask for help, to ask other people to help, that, you know, as an individual, help create change in this family. Before we jump into the personal boundary system, are there any, any questions so far about um, any of the work that we do at FREE? I don't have anybody typing anything in at this point, Jennifer, so it um, looks like you're good to go. Um, so again, when we talk about uh, the personal boundary system, what we really want to look at is developing boundaries to keep yourself safe and sane. So how do you help a client develop boundaries that keep them safe and sane? And this definition of the personal boundary system is pulled from the work of Pia Melody. Um, she has several books, but I would recommend starting with the book called Facing Codependence um, if you're interested in additional information on the personal boundary system. Um, and we will go into more detail about some ways that you can communicate to facilitate functional intimacy mm -hmm. later in the presentation. Um, but for now, I just want you to have a general sense of what it feels like to be moderate in our boundary system. So a personal boundary system is a system that protects and contains a person during physical or emotional intimate contact. Functional intimacy occurs when a person receives the reality of another or expresses their reality without being too vulnerable or closed off. So again, it's all about moderation. When a person has dysfunctional boundaries, they will be offensive in their expression of self and will be overly sensitive when receiving the reality of others. So again, we're looking at that extreme. Um, if, I, if, I, if I'm too sensitive, I'm letting too much in. Um, if, if I'm overly sensitive, I'm going to react strongly. So again, it's about reducing that reactivity activity internally and externally. So there are two main components of the personal boundary system. There's the external boundary system and the internal boundary system. Uh, the internal system can be a little more difficult to understand and moderate, and we'll spend more time on that. But um, obviously, the external boundary system protects and contains the body. So it's used when um, in physical or sexual intimacy. So allowing someone to stand close to you, to hug you, um, to be physically intimate with someone. The internal boundary system protects and contains the mind, the spirit, the emotions, and it's used during intellectual and emotional intimacy. So our protective boundary is that which we receive. So we decide what comes into our internal boundary system. And then the containing boundary is what we give. So if we take a closer look at the internal boundary system, um, I want to highlight what it is to have dysfunctional, dysfunctional boundaries, dysfunctional internal boundaries. So if we have no boundaries at all, 
if we have no walls, we are just open, then our listening boundary, which is our protective boundary, it's when we're listening to know another person, we will often be reactive to others' thoughts and emotions, and we will often take the blame. Um, our talking or our containing boundary, if we have no walls, we are just going to talk off the top of our heads. We're going to say whatever comes to mind. We are not going to contain our emotions, and we're going to give a lot of blame. If I'm completely walled off, if I'm totally surrounded in armor, then in my listening boundary, I'm not going to listen to what anyone has to say. I don't really care what's important to you. I'm going to completely walled off and shut in my own space. I'm also not going to give anything. So that talking boundary, my containment, I'm going to be fully con contained. I am not going to tell others um, what is important to me. I'm not going to share. Um, I'm going to be completely shut down. If we look at a functional internal boundary system, then we can see that as we listen, so that protective boundary, we'll sort through what others are saying and feeling. We're going to filter through what we hear coming at us, and we're going to decide what comes into us based on what we personally know the truth to be. So I may have someone say, you know what, Jen, you're a little selfish. And I may think, Wow, ouch, that hurts. But that's true. So I'm going to keep that in, and I'm going to let it shape my behavior. What do I have to learn from this? Or they may say, wow, Jen, you are completely and totally selfish, and you only think of yourself. And I'm going to think, oh, my wall is going to be up a little bit. That is not true. That's not going to come in. I get to decide what comes in based on the truth as I know it. My, my talking or my containing boundary is going to allow me to speak in a clear, calm, and respectful manner. And it's going to allow me to release my emotions with moderation. So the pause between the listening and the talking, the pause between those two behaviors is the difference between reacting and responding. And this is where knowing our personal triggers and really understanding our subjective reality becomes imperative to family healing and change. So we have to have a healthy sense of self. We have to stay centered there to build a healthy relationship with others. It's easier to work on fixing other people in our life, but it's certainly not more productive. And so we really need to start to redirect our attention back to what we can control, which is typically ourselves. Um, you know, I always say, you always hear people say that, uh, you know, you really have to love yourself before you can get into a relationship. And I, I work with a lot of, you know, 20 and 30 somethings, and uh, many of them are really wanting that that personal, intimate relationship to come into their life. But, and I say, I hate to say it, but first you have to fall in love with yourself, and you do. You have to be centered and know yourself um, in a very healthy, loving way to move forward in a relationship with other people. So how do we start to do that? Um, well, let's look at some of the areas that family members really struggle with when we're working to build, sometimes build, not rebuild, um, healthy relationships in families. The admission of powerlessness uh, makes many people feel very uncomfortable. Um, as individuals, we want to believe that we have full control over our life. Um, certainly as parents and loved ones of addicts, we want to believe that our actions can control the fate of our loved one's addiction. Most people equate powerlessness with a total and other, utter loss of control. Uh, most parents especially panic at the realization that their attempts, both subtle and sometimes wildly over the top, have failed to quote-unquote cure their child's addiction. So the energy that we direct toward attempting to do so is just completely wasted. Um, so I want you to picture an individual who's sitting in the car, which is knee deep in mud, and they've got the gas pedal slammed down, and they're burning through so many resources, in this case fuel, but their tires are just spinning wildly in the mud, and they're going nowhere. They're stuck. Uh, this is when families often come to us. I'm sure many of you can identify with families either in your own family or families that you work with who are in this place. So the goal is to turn an individual's attention to that which they can, 
that, that which they can control and create some traction and therefore some movement. I'm big on movement. Um, I want to see movement in the family in some way, shape, or form. With that goal in mind, we will discuss creating influence as opposed to attempting to control, detaching, hopefully with a little bit of love, from the outcome or the issue and not the person, and then communicating our own subjective reality and also being able to receive the subjective reality of another person. The full spectrum of powerlessness really hit home for me when I was working with the family of a young woman who was in residential treatment for substance use disorder. Um, by most societal standards, um, the family would be defined as quote unquote normal. The parents had made what most of us would consider to be the right choices in child rearing. Um, they moved to the best school district. They were encouraging and supportive. Their children were involved in various activities. They were warm and loving in their interactions as a family. But still, this bright and very beautiful young woman had grown up with incredibly low self-esteem. She was in abusive relationships in high school and college. She began to experiment with drugs and alcohol in high school, which eventually led to her admission into a residential treatment center during her sophomore year of college. And as I listened to her describe her subjective reality, and the sadness and the tragedy that occurred as the result of her interpretation of the events of her life, I, honest to God, became sick to my stomach. And I thought about my own children and the opportunities and protection I hoped to provide for them to ensure a healthy and successful life. And it occurred to me that none of it mattered. I could do everything right, but that would not guarantee the outcome that I, as a parent, so desperately wanted for my kids. I was powerless. Fear overcame my body. I am in the middle of a family conference, and stress hormones just surged through my system. I started to shake. I started to sweat. As the realization hit me that I had no way of predicting the outcome of my child's life, my illusion of total control and power in my children's life evaporated. I had no control. And I sat there during this family conference, and I wrestled with the idea of my own powerlessness. And it occurred to me that if I had no control, then it didn't really matter what I did, which also meant that the mistakes I know I've made in raising my own children didn't mean they were going to be scarred for life. Um, and relief overcame my body. Endorphins and dopamine flooded my system. I had to try not to laugh. I'm absolutely sure I looked crazy. But I realized I didn't have to be a perfect mother. And there was still a pretty good chance my children were going to turn out OK. I was free. Total control and complete freedom lie at the extremes on the spectrum of powerlessness. But somewhere balanced in the middle is an, a, a very important concept to consider when navigating a life in recovery, or perhaps just navigating a life in general. And that concept is influence. Coaching parents to understand the differences between control and influence is the first step toward family recovery. We are capable of influencing movement in the life of another with our own movement. And as we become aware of what we cannot control, we also become aware of that which we can control. And once we move through the shock and the fear of feeling powerless and the euphoria of being responsibility free, we find ourselves in a very, very powerful place. So how do we create influence? Creating influence involves a complete focus on your own choices and actions. Um, this is often difficult for people in, in crisis, certainly very difficult for parents to do, um, as many people feel that focusing on ourselves is selfish. But the only thing you can control in any given situation is you. So I encourage people to ask themselves, what should I do in this situation? Not what should my child or my loved one do. It's very difficult to make that shift. Um, but the importance of this focus became very clear to me in my own life um, with my son Jonas, who at the time was probably three or four. It's a very difficult time in our family and my relationship with him. And so we were in our very dysfunctional behavior pattern where he would you know, very drastically and dramatically act out. I would respond in turn um, in tantrums as loudly and effectively 
you know, as my three-year-old. And then I would crawl into bed full of shame and depression and cry. And then he would act out again. I would react back and scream and, and holler and, and absolutely be the mother I hoped I would never be. Crawl back into bed full of shame, depression, and cry. And while I was doing this, I was watching myself. I was very mindful of this pattern, and yet I was trapped in it. I couldn't stop. And I was texting a friend. Um, who had the wisdom, no matter what I said, to only respond to me with, what should you do in this situation? So by the, about the fifth time she asked me, what should you do in this situation, I finally decided to listen and I thought, well, it's about noon, I haven't eaten, I am emotionally and physically drained, I should probably eat a banana. Um, and so that simple act of eating a banana, that simple act of focusing on myself for a minute, allowed me to stabilize, to center, to physically stabilize, um, emotionally redirect myself, and change my behavior, which in turn changed my son's behavior. I was able to break the pattern. People intellectually know this, but what does it really look like in real life? And so I often use stories like that and examples that are less emotionally recharged for parents and family members in recovery. When we incorporate examples or stories, um, people are able to see outside of themselves or their situation. And when they do this, their common sense kicks in. And that's what we want. We want their common sense to kick in. If I'm continually using, using emotionally charged examples, then they're going to get hung up on their own private logic, their own misinterpretations, their mistaken beliefs. Um, they are going to be in a continually triggered state. They could potentially be having small trauma responses that you're not aware of. But if they're triggered and they are having a small trauma or stress response, they're not going to be in the reasoning and logic centers of their brain. They're going to be in their emotional brain. And learning and movement will not take place. So when we ask ourselves what needs to change, the answer is always going to be you. Because that's the only thing that you have the power to change. So how do we find choice in any situation? I ask parents to really make a list. What can you can control? Uh, the rate of your breathing, the sound of your voice, the thoughts that are coming into your head, your physical location. Leave the room if you need to. Uh, how you're spending your time, how you're spending your money, what takes place in your house, how your house feels, what your house looks like, what you allow to take place there, um, your car, um, any other assets. Um, a lot of things, especially young people, think that you know their cell phone, their car, their college tuition, all of these things are birthrights. We ask parents to look at this. We ask loved ones to look at what they're giving as an investment and, and what's the return on that investment. Um, I'll often have you know families in my in my office and and they look totally defeated, but honestly, I think they've just surrendered. And sometimes that fatigue that comes with surrender looks a lot like defeat. Um, and as parents continually search for the right choice in any situation, um, it's important to remind them that there are no guarantees. There's no magic bullet here. Um, Brené Brown says in her book, Daring Greatly, um, which if you haven't read, I definitely recommend it, Somewhere buried deep inside our hopes and fears for our children is the terrifying truth that there is no such thing as perfect parenting and there are no guarantees. You can influence your child's movement by focusing on and becoming the person you hope to be, but that does not guarantee an outcome. I encourage parents to wholeheartedly enter into the process of their own recovery with a focus on keeping themselves sane and healthy. It's truly about progress and not perfection. So I, worked, I work with family members to detach from what they feel is the perfect outcome and encourage them to stay connected more generally to their personal desires and values. Again, this is all more easily said than done. So when we find ourselves in these highly triggering, volatile situations, how do we redirect our focus? Um, how do we admit powerlessness over another person's behavior and start to see that our lives have become unmanageable in, in attempting to focus all of our energy on controlling what they do. And again, I'll share a story <clears throat> excuse me, about my son and I. And again, this was when Jonas was about three. 
and um, it was a typical morning, but it was during the polar vortex here in Minnesota, and it was January, so it was about negative 30 outside. I, as usual, was about 10 minutes late for work, and I still needed to drop him off um, at his daycare providers. He could not find his one of his favorite black and green gloves, um, and if any of you have ever raised a toddler, you will realize that sometimes this is earth-shattering, life-threatening. Um, and so he had stripped himself down to almost naked and was underneath the kitchen table screaming and hollering and yelling awful things at me and uh, banging the chairs. And I was standing there in the kitchen and I thought, okay, I talk about this every day. I'm going to walk the walk here. So what can I control? I can control me. I'm not going to yell at him. I've been doing that for two years. I'm not going to try to convince him the glove doesn't matter. I tried that. It also doesn't work. I need to keep myself focused on me. And what I need to do is calmly and quickly get him in the car and get him to daycare where I know he will be safe and sane so that I can get to work where I know I will be safe and sane. So I took some time and I focused on my breathing. I calmed my heart rate down. I tried to manage my own stress response at that time, really focusing on my physical body. How did I bring my body down so that I could calmly and collectively address the situation? And I walked over to the table where he was screaming and kicking and banging chairs, and I bent down, and I said, buddy, I'm going to take all of our stuff out to the car, and then I'm going to come back, and I'm going to get you, and I'm going to carry you to the car just as you are. And I carried all of our stuff out to the car, I put his clothes and his coat and everything in there because it was very, very cold outside. Um, I knew he would probably get dressed pretty quickly once he got in the car. I walked back into the house. I grabbed his leg. I said, buddy, I'm going to pull you out now, and I'm going to carry you to the car just as you are. I drug him out. I put him under my arm like a, <laughs> like a football, kicking and screaming. I walked over. I kissed my other two children goodbye, and I put him in the car. And um, I started to drive to his daycare provider. He did very quickly get dressed, and he buckled himself in. And he sat in the back of the car, and I, I heard him mumble something. And I said, what did you say, buddy? And he said, I'm sorry I acted that way, Mommy. Now, my son had never apologized to me um, up to that point. And so I, of course, cried like any good mother um, would do. And I just said, you know, that's okay, buddy. We have a lot of work to do. But my lesson in that moment was the game had changed. The outcome had changed. But I had never focused any of my attention or effort on changing Jonas's behavior. All of my intention and effort went to focusing on myself. The next concept I want to talk about is detaching. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about detaching with love, and it's it's very confusing, and how do we do that? So detachment or detaching with love um, tends to be another concept that makes family members very uncomfortable. Um, and so I often use a kite metaphor to help parents visualize what it means to detach from a loved one's addiction while staying connected to that child. Um, and so I want you to imagine that you're holding a kite on a really windy day. Now, I grew up in Illinois with no trees, open plains. So when I'm talking windy, I'm talking very, very windy. And so just having the wind howling across the prairie and you're trying to hold this kite very close to your face and you're trying to really, really control what it's doing. And that kite is thrashing in the wind and essentially just beating your face to a, to a pulp. Yes. But if we let go of that string and we allow the kite to, to move up on the wind's currents on its own, we're still attached to the kite. We still have the string, but we're not forcing movement of the kite. Our own movement will create movement in the kite, but we're not talking about total control here. So how do we influence the movement of the kite? Again, we're going to focus on our own recovery. And Brené Brown, in her book Daring Greatly Again, writes about what she calls wholehearted parenting. And she writes that she believes the best gift you can give your child is to be the type of adult you hope they grow up to be. And so we influence our children with our values, 
with our actions, and with the story of our own journey. And when we do this, we detach from fear. We detach from the anxiety of not being able to control another person's journey. And we detach from the specific outcomes we think are necessary to create a healthy, joyful, balanced life. There are many, many paths to success. And they look differently for each person. We detach from the resistance we feel toward what's happening in the present moment. And when we accept what is, and we stop trying to force outcomes, we allow for a broader path forward to emerge. So how do we start to get people to focus on their own recovery? Um, I really, really want to encourage people to keep it simple. Um, so parents and family members are often impacted um, in these areas up here, you know, physical family and friends, feelings and moods, thinking and reasoning, work and school and spirituality. Um, in the same way as our loved one who is suffering more specifically from a behavioral or mental health issue. So we may see weight loss or weight gain, mood swings, isolation from family and friends. So what I do is I ask family members, all family members, to pick one category and to commit to a specific observable goal that they are willing to implement in an effort to care for themselves. Self-care is not selfish. Parents may be able to make a list of items that they really hope to change. People often will you know, bring in a list of 20 things that they want to do to recreate or resurrect their lives. Um, but I encourage people to really focus on doing a couple things really, really well so that they don't become overwhelmed. We really want to avoid that analysis paralysis. Um, and you also want to highlight that progress in one area will impact many other areas. So if I have someone come in and they want to focus on the physical and they say, I want to start exercising. Okay, so the, or, you know, the goal is to be in better um, physical shape. Then I want a very specific action plan and action steps underneath that goal. So how are you going to achieve that? And then this becomes our recovery plan. We will do this for each area. How are you going to achieve that? So I'm going to go to the gym four times a week, and I'm going to exercise for 45 minutes, and I'm going to do yoga once a week. So I've created a plan. I'm going to put in place some accountability. Maybe that's through me. Maybe each week or throughout the week I'm going to check on their progress. Maybe they have another loved one who's willing to do that for them. But then we talk about how, you know, when I exercise, I have more energy to spend time with family and friends. Um, we know that exercise also impacts our mental health pretty drastically. So our feelings and moods are now on the upswing. We also know that exercise creates more productivity. So our thinking and reasoning, our brain is working a little bit better. And that's going to make work or school quite a bit easier. So we see that one thing impacted almost that entire pie. Um, so we don't want people to get overwhelmed. And we want them, I, I allow my clients and my families to prioritize what those goals are for them. And so it becomes a very empowering process. So through focusing on powerlessness, we actually come up with a very empowering recovery plan for all members. We also spend quite a bit of time um, in my office focusing on objective versus, versus subjective reality. Um, and to some of you, that may sound like something that's very simple, but you would be surprised at how much time it actually takes people to separate what is true fact from their interpretation of fact. Um, so when we're communicating, we want to encourage family members to focus on communicating their own experience which is always going to be subjective. Objective reality involves expressing or dealing with facts or conditions as perceived without distortion by personal feelings, prejudices, or interpretations. Subjective reality refers to the meaning a person assigns to things and events. And so this varies and is based on an individual's unique perspective and interpretation of the world. Um, I will work with families and, and I'll say, you know, okay, can you state the fact? and then what you made up about the fact. So if the fact is um, my husband came in and slammed to the door, um, and it, that 
that is the fact at hand. What I make up about that is that he is very angry with me and then I, I feel anger, right? But maybe the actual objective fact was that the wind caught the door. Um, so it's difficult for family members, especially when they're very, very ingrained in um, unproductive behaviors, to really sort out what actually happened versus um, what happened after it passed through their, their filter or their interpretation. And I want you to think about how often we do this with family members, how often we, we do this with anyone in our lives where we try to impose our experience and our interpretation of the situation um, onto them. And so again, my, my son Jonas, who I'm, I'm pretty sure was given to me um, so that I had intimate experience with all of these concepts, uh, taught me probably one of the most powerful lessons of my life so far. And um, this was again when he was about three. And one of the ways that I would get a little bit of a break and, and calm him down was to put him in the bath. And he loved the bath. And so I was running a bath for him. I was pretty triggered. I was very annoyed, to use a less clinical word. Um, and he got into the tub and he said, oh, mom, this water is too hot for me. And I said, Jonas, this water is not too hot. And I bent over and put my hand in the water. And he walked up to me in the tub and he bent down his little baby face right next to mine. And he said, this water is too hot, mom. It burns me. And I said, this water is not too hot. And he said, for me, mom, this water is too hot for me. And I thought, oh, my Lord, of course it is. I am arguing with you about how this hot water feels on your brand new baby skin versus my adult callous tan. But I want you to think of how often we do that in relationship to other people. How often we say, no, this is how it should feel to you. And how much conflict that causes. So how do we start to communicate our our um, subjective reality. Again, I want, I want to encourage people to keep it very simple. Um, and again, this comes out of Pia Melody's work. Um, but simplicity when you're learning new habits is key. So stick to the basics. And I know sometimes using these formulas may feel a little robotic. Um, but with any new habit or behavior, I think it's best to have a plan. And I encourage my clients not just to communicate this way, but begin to think this way so that as they're encountering other people, they are constantly building an awareness of their interpretation of the situation. So we look at this, and if you look at this formula, formula what it is is data, thought, and then feeling. And so the data is the objective reality. When I heard you or saw you do this. So when I saw you, slam the door. And then the next part is the thought. What I made up about this is. I like to use what I made up about this because that's really what's happening. This is where we start to see all of our mistaken beliefs are, um, you know, what we believe we behave. So we start to see this come up. So when, you, I, when I saw you slam the door, what I made up about that is you're angry because I didn't do the dishes. And about what I made up, I feel very angry. And then I can ask, is that true or not true? And maybe my husband says, I didn't slam the door. The wind caught the door. As opposed to me saying, you slammed that door. I've been working all day. You don't know how hard it's been. And now we're having you know, a fight erupt as soon as he walks on the door um, after work. So how do we start to communicate our subjective reality and kind of fact check that with the people that we are in relationship with? We want to encourage people again to communicate basic emotions. You know, I feel glad, I feel sad, I feel mad, I feel scared. I encourage them to think about, you know, less is more. Do not lecture. No one is listening. No one is listening. Less is more. And whenever a loved one asks me what they should do or say in a given situation, I always encourage them to go back to describing your experience. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what to do in a situation, describe your experience of, a situa of the situation. Use this formula. Um, 
when we communicate this way, we don't put people on the defensive. It's, it's non-confrontational. It allows for discussion. So how do we listen? So we want to communicate to be known, and we want to listen to know another person. So how do we communicate to understand someone else's subjective reality? I think the first part is don't make assumptions. You don't know how the water feels to them, right? We don't want to make assumptions. We want to be curious without interrogating. Nobody wants to have 100 questions asked. Again, less is more. And check it with the person. You know, I noticed that you're doing this. I assume that you did that because. Is that true? Is that not true? And I also want to encourage people to remember that it is possible to validate someone else's experience without agreeing with it. You may have a teenage daughter who comes home and is wildly upset because you won't buy her a pair of $400 designer jeans. Now, most of us can't agree that maybe that's a ridiculous thing to be that upset about. But we can still say, wow, I can see that this is really painful for you. I wonder what's going on with that. Maybe she's not feeling so secure at school. Maybe she just wants the jeans. You can still say, I see that this is really upsetting for you, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you're in pain. I can validate that she's in pain uh, without shaming her for feeling that. Now, we can talk about you know, uh, how to adequately process those feelings if she's being completely reactionary, but that's, that's a different lecture. Um, a mother on my caseload a couple of years ago told me that when she began her own recovery journey many, many years ago, she went to a meeting and they gave her a card with three simple things listed on it. Don't drink, go to meetings, pray. And so she told me that when she left the family program, um, that she wished that she had left with a card that also listed three simple things she was supposed to do. Um, and so I really, really wanted to conclude this presentation with three simple, <coughs> excuse me, specific things that you could coach family members to do to sustain long-term family recovery. But I had to detach from my own specific outcomes. And remember that each individual and each family has to construct the values and behaviors that hold their recovery in place. So as professionals, we can help family members find their own specific three simple things by focusing on the following three not so simple things. So help your clients find, find your power, find their power. Um, help yourself find your power. Continually ask yourself, what can I do in this situation? Redirect the focus over and over again back to you. Detach from a defined outcome. That resistance, um, that, that clinging, that grasping creates so much stress and strain. So do something each day to focus on your own journey so you're not focusing on someone else's. Honor your personal experience while validating your loved ones. Communicate your experience. Ask about someone else's experience. We exist in relationship to each, each other. That's where our healing is going to take place. We want to facilitate um, that connection between family members, however you define a family, whatever your social support network is. We want to facilitate that connection. And one of the best ways to do that is to know how to communicate your personal experience and show curiosity for anyone else's personal experience. It takes a lot of strength and courage. It, it takes being vulnerable and trying new behaviors um, and letting go of those known behavior patterns that so many of us cling to, not because they work well, but just simply because they're known. So I just want to you know, end with a quote here um, by Brené Brown again. I spent a lot of years trying to outrun or outsmart vulnerability by making things certain and definite, black and white, good and bad. My inability to lean into the discomfort of vulnerability limited the fullness of those important experiences that are wrought with uncertainty. Love, belonging, trust, joy, and creativity, just to name a few. 
Um, if you have if you have any other questions um, that don't get answered here, or a specific question that maybe you don't want to share, feel free to um, call our 800 number uh, or visit our website. You can email me through the website. Just a quick note: we are in the uh, we are in the process of transitioning um, to free to family recovery resource experts. That web address does work, but it will redirect you in the next couple of days to markhurtsconsulting.com. You are in the right place. You can go ahead and, and, again, contact me through the website, and I'll return your email from there. Um, otherwise, I'm, I'm open to taking questions now. Thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. There is a question that was posed by Johnny Allen. Um, hello, Johnny. Nice to have you here. I wanted to communicate a question over. Can you comment on building peer relationships for sharing and mutual education? Connection seems to heal. Um, so, Bill, you know, again, as I said there at the end, I, for me, this entire process is really about connection whether that's in your family of origin. It's really how you define your social support. So I would encourage um, people to use these tech techniques and this approach with anyone. Um, if, when I'm helping um, a young person try to build um, new friendships uh, as they're beginning their recovery, these are some of the same tools. For me, these are basic skills, basic tools of life. And if I am able to understand my experience in contrast to someone else's experience, I'm going to be a better support network for that person, whether I'm their mother, their sister, their wife, their therapist, their friend. Um, it's just a good, solid approach. I hope that answers the question. If, if not, feel free to comment again. Great. Um, there has a Chuck has asked, do you have a Facebook page to share, or will there be one in the near future? Um, I don't have a Facebook page right now. Again, we're going to be launching our our new website here in the next um, few days to a week, um, and I will be on that website. There will be videos there. Um, you will be able to contact me through that through that website. But right now, I do not have a professional Facebook page. Okay. Um, there are uh, several people that are asking about access to the slide deck. Um, how can they get access to the slide deck? I believe our um, outreach director will be sending, sending, I think we have the list of participants and emails, and so we will be sending that out within the next day or so. Perfect. Sounds good. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in. We'll give someone another five or ten seconds. Um, if anyone has any additional questions, you have access to Jennifer's information. Feel free to connect with her. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for participating in our webinar today. We wish you all a wonderful and safe Thanksgiving. Thank you, Jennifer, for your time. We appreciate you spending time with us, sharing with us this wonderful information. The webinar will be made available as a recorded webinar. Um, all of you will receive an email through Lakeview for those of you that would like to have access to it, you can also visit us on our website at lakeviewhealth.com. Thank you, Jennifer, for your time today. Thanks. Thanks for being here, everybody.